We have uh, this program for uh, opening the workshop. We have uh, Professor Supratik Chakravarti, who is also the chairman of the FSTTCS conference. He's also our first speaker. Uh, so welcome all of you. I mean, some of you are coming for the first time in uh, Bombay. Bombay is very privileged to have you here. So my welcome, welcome from the conference. And uh, without too much ceremony, let me ask Supratik to do the reading. So uh, yes, to add to what Paritosh said, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we hope the next seven days, actually, we have two days of pre-conference workshops, three days of the conference, and two days of post-conference workshop. We hope uh, this will be uh, an, an exciting time for all of us. We'll hear lots of technical stuff, discussions, and hopefully we'll also have a lot of fun. So uh, without much uh, uh, you know, other elaborations, I think we'll just get started on today's workshop. So today's workshop uh, is on finite and algorithmic model theory. And uh, I, uh, I mean, we have put up the schedule on the web page, but I'll just spend a minute saying about the structure of the workshop. So this is spread over two days, today and tomorrow. And uh, today's talks are going to be more of introductory and sort of building up the material for tomorrow's uh, more advanced talks. Uh, so today we will have a total of uh, uh, four invited speakers uh, and uh, some of us from uh, here, from IIT Bombay, who will be trying to give some introductory material. So I will start the session. I will talk about something very basic. And then uh, my PhD student, Abhishek, will talk about EF games. And then uh, Ramanujam is going to talk about uh, Feigen's theorem and uh, second order horn and all of that. And after that, uh, post lunch, we will have talks by uh, Anuj Tawar, Fukion Colitis, uh, Emmanuel Kaironsky, and Dietmar. And tomorrow we have uh, more advanced talks by five speakers. So uh, it's a very packed schedule for each of the days of the workshop. We start at 9, end at 6.15. Uh, we have interspersed it with lots of food breaks in between. Hopefully, uh, those will keep you going and will uh, add the sugar necessary to keep your eyes open during the sessions. Uh, but uh, I hope we'll also get a lot of time to do some interactions and discussions over those breaks. That's also the purpose of keeping multiple breaks. So uh, I'll get going. Uh, uh, I'm going to use the blackboard because I'm really talking about some preliminary stuff. Uh, and some of the speakers later are going to use the projection system. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, of course, I'm sure everybody here is uh, aware of the basics of first order logic. <coughs> but I will, just to be complete, I'll just cover the uh, syntax and semantics quickly. And then the, the primary uh, thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, undecidability of uh, satisfiability in the finite. So this is uh, Trachtenbot's theorem. So I'll try to outline a simple proof for it and why uh, making something finite, why asking questions about finite models often becomes harder than asking questions without restrictions about the models. So uh, just to get going, uh, I'm sure all of us are familiar with this, but uh, let me just write it down over here. So we'll have the syntax. <clears throat> so we have a vocabulary which uh, I will call sigma. And this is going to be a set of predicate and function symbols, each with given arities. So this could be arity 1, this could be arity 3, and so on. And uh, then we want to build sentences on this vocabulary using some rules which govern what are valid sentences. Uh, so for that, I'm going to define two things first. So one is what are called terms. And then I'll define what are called formulas. So what is a term? Uh, every variable is a term. So we have this vocabulary, and we're going to form formulas on this vocabulary. So this formula is going to have some variables. 
So every variable is a term. <coughs> uh, every function of arity i applied to i terms is a term. Uh, so if I have a function of arity 0, which is like a constant function, so that will also be a term which does not take any arguments, but it is a term. Uh, and that is pretty much the definition of what a term is. So we start with variables and constants and then if we apply terms as arguments to functions we get other terms. And what are formulas? So the basic formulas are predicates. So I could have a predicate let us say P1 whose arity might be I and then if I feed in I terms as arguments that forms a basic formula that is the really uh, you know you cannot decompose this further into sub formulas so this is sort of the uh, most basic formula that you have in first order logic and then uh, we have the usual connectives uh, so for example if phi 1 is a formula and phi 2 is a formula then so is phi 1 conjunction phi 2 so is negation phi 1 so is disjunction which follows once I have negation and conjunction. Uh, implication all of the usual propositional connectives and in addition we have uh, two others really one other. So if I have a formula phi uh, with a variable x and the variable x could appear as part of a term which is an argument of a predicate then I could use a quantifier and uh, if I quantify out a free variable uh, if I quantify out such a variable which appears in a formula I get a new formula and this formula uh, loses this variable as a free variable this becomes a bound variable and then we have the universal quantifier which is really obtained by negating the existential quantifier. <coughs> so that is very quick uh, I am sure all of you are well aware of this but that is just to keep things complete. So that is the syntax uh, we are talking about and uh, yes okay and uh, for the semantics. We will uh, we'll say that okay to if, if I give you a first order logic formula and then if I ask you whether it evaluates to true or false I need to tell you on what to evaluate the formula. So uh, we are going to have a notion of structures and I believe this is going to show up several times uh, over the next few days. So I am going to define I am going to define semantics by first talking about structures and then saying when does a formula evaluate to true on a given structure. So what is a structure? A structure has a certain universe which is really a set of elements. So this is really a set of elements let us say A1, A2. It, it could even be an infinite set <coughs> and it has an interpretation for every predicate. in sigma and for every function in sigma. So what does this mean? So if I take a function let us say f1 whose arity is 5, so let me call this universe as u. So if I take a function f1 whose arity is 5, then the interpretation of this given by a structure would really be a mapping from u raised to 5 to u. So it will take a 5 tuple from the, un from the universe multiplied by with itself 5 times and will return me back an element from the universe. So an interpretation of a function in a structure is really the specification of this mapping from a tuple which has as many components as the arity of the function to an element back in the universe and the interpretation of a predicate so for example if I take P1 with arity 2 this is really a mapping from u raised to 2 to true or false. So this just tells me for given pairs of elements from the universe uh, whether it evaluates to true or false okay. And so we will often denote structures by different symbols so for example I am going to denote it by M. So to show that the universe refers to a particular structure the interpretations refer to particular structure we often annotate it with M somewhere over here saying that this is the interpretation of this predicate with this arity on this universe on this structure 
and this is the interpretation of the function with this arity on that structure, and that's the universe of that structure. Okay, so, so now that we know what a structure is, uh, let me uh, try to define the semantics. So we will say that uh, <coughs> every variable, so in trying to define the semantics, every variable should be mapped to some element from the universe. So every variable should take on a value from the universe. So given a structure M, every variable should take on a certain value from the universe. And then a function with let us say arity 2 on this structure. Remember it takes arguments as other terms. So what I am going to do is uh, I am going to say that if the variable takes on a certain value from the universe just to keep uh, the notation consistent I will denote it by this. So this denotes the value of the variable x uh, that it takes in the structure m and then the value of the function f when I have t1, t2, let us say this is a variety 2, this is uh, the value of this function in the structure m. This is the interpretation of the function in the structure m with the arguments evaluated over the structure m. it just says you evaluate the arguments which are terms themselves over the structure m then you look at the interpretation of the function in that structure and you find out what value you get from the universe. So, uh, so that is what allows us to get values for terms in a given structure and then to evaluate whether a formula evaluates to true or false uh, we just need to substitute values for these terms in a given structure and then look at the interpretation of the predicate from the given structure to see whether it evaluates to true or false. So I will just write it down here. So I will use the same notation. So let us say P1 with arity 2 with T1, T2 in the structure M. So this will be whatever true or false value this interpretation gives me on T1 in the structure M and T2 in the structure M. <coughs> So that is the easy case where I evaluate each of these terms and I know how to evaluate them <coughs> and I just look up the interpretation of the predicate to figure out whether it evaluates to true or false. Uh, these are simple uh, if I want to evaluate uh, if I want to find out the truth value of <coughs> phi 1 and phi 2 I take the truth value of phi 1 truth value of phi 2 and if both of them evaluate to true then this formula evaluates to true. This is the usual negation <coughs> you know so, so I, I could ask I could say like this that uh, given a model M I can evaluate this formula this is also written sometimes as the model M satisfies this if and only if this thing is true. Now you note that in trying to evaluate the terms I may actually need to use the values of some variables. So if there are actually variables appearing over there in the terms then uh, we also need to indicate the assignments of the variables to the values from the universe. So that is usually called an environment so I will denote it by L which is like the variables to the universe, the universe of N. So given a structure and the assignment of variables to values in the universe. I can evaluate a predicate by looking at this and checking whether it is true and similarly I can say that M satisfies phi 1 and phi 2 uh, under a given assignment of values to variables if and only if M satisfies phi 1 and M satisfies phi 2. Uh, negation phi is similar M satisfies negation phi if and only if M does not satisfy phi and uh, the only other thing remaining are the quantifiers. <coughs> so we will say M satisfies exists x phi of x if and only if uh, this is under certain assignment of the free variables of this formula. So if and only if M 
with some augmented assignment. So this L assigns the same values of the other variables other than X as L assigns but to X it assigns some value from the universe if this satisfies phi L. So, the, so L prime is so L prime of Y is L of Y if Y is not an X. Is for some L prime and L prime X is in U of N. Okay, so it's just saying that there is some way of assigning a value to this variable to make this formula true if I remove the quantifier. And uh, the universal quantifier is just obtained. So. So if and only if M does not satisfy, uh, sorry, it's the universal quantifier. X is six, negation five x. Okay, so this is pretty standard stuff. I don't want to spend too much time on it. So having uh, set our notation right and what we mean by a structure satisfying. Uh, first order formula. Uh, so what I want to uh, now uh, quickly show is that so uh, you know a question to ask is that if I give you a formula phi in first order logic then is it satisfiable or not. This means that does there exist a structure over which this formula evaluates to true. Right, and uh, this is a decision question. Now, it turns out that if I don't put any restrictions on the structures, which means I'm looking at finite as well as infinite structures, and all kinds of interpretations for the predicates, this formula is undecidable. But this workshop is uh, primarily about finite model theory, where we're going to look at structures that are finite. So an interesting question to ask is that well if I give you a first order logic formula and I ask you that you are only allowed to look at finite structures where this universe is finite, uh, can we still decide whether this formula is satisfiable or not? It turns out that it is undecidable even in the finite. And this is Strachan-Bott's theorem and uh, I want to quickly sketch the intuition behind why it turns out to be undecidable even when we restrict the structures to to uh, finite structures. <clears throat> so what we are going to do is or the, the basic idea of the proof intuition is that uh, we are going to take a Turing machine and this is the classical proof approach uh, to show something as undecidable you take a Turing machine and then you show the halting problem can be reduced to the problem that you are trying to solve and we all know that the halting problem is undecidable. So the given problem must be undecidable. So we are going to take a Turing machine M and to keep things simple we can even take a deterministic Turing machine M and uh, to keep things further simple we can say that let it start with the empty tape so I have a deterministic Turing machine uh, I have used M for something else over there so let me call it N. So I'm going to take a deterministic Turing machine starting with the empty tape and then I'm going to ask does this Turing machine halt. So even this problem is known to be undecidable. I mean this is from you know classical uh, computational theory that deterministic Turing machines and non-deterministic Turing machines have uh, the same expressive power and starting with an empty tape does not uh, simplify things. So uh, the halting problem for this is known to be undecidable. And uh, what we are going to do is we are going to take this problem and we are going to come up with a formula in first order logic over a suitable vocabulary which I will just describe called phi n such that phi n has a finite model which means there is a finite structure that satisfies phi n if and only if n halts, n, n halts on the empty tape. And because we know that this is an undecidable problem this immediately shows that this problem is also going to be undecidable and this is just a first order logic formula 
on a suitable vocabulary. Okay, so therefore, checking the satisfiability in finite must be undecidable. So, uh, I don't have much time, so I will just quickly try to list down the instead of writing the exact formula what phi n is, I just try to list down the different components of the formula, and then I think it should be easy to put to, to write down explicit formula for the different. We want to take a universe. So you know to, to keep things further simple, let me say that this Turing machine N has states, uh, let's say 0, 1, 2, k, which I can always do. The Turing machine has finite number of states. Uh, this Turing machine will have a certain tape alphabet. So, let, so these are the states. There's a certain tape alphabet. So let's say the tape alphabet is. Uh, 0, 1 to some m, okay? And this is a deterministic Turing machine, which means that if I give you a state and a tape alphabet, then, uh, and an element from the tape alphabet, then I can tell you what next state is going to be, what the next value that will be written at that position of the head, and where the head is going to stay there, move left or move right, okay? So that's, that's deterministically decided. So what we're going to do is, we're going to uh, build the formula phi n as a conjunction of several things. And the first thing we will say is that uh, uh, there are at least say k plus 1 elements in the universe. <coughs> and this is easy to state in first order logic. You just say that there exist k plus 1 elements, all of which are not the same. Uh, the second thing I will state is, uh, oh, so I should also define what my vocabulary is. So my vocabulary will have a predicate which I'll call state, which will really take two things. And if state m comma n is true, uh, okay, so I should write it down separately. So my vocabulary has uh, a binary predicate, let's call it state. So state m comma n is true if and only if uh, the machine m when started on empty tape is in state m in the nth step. This is a standard uh, trick to use. And similarly, I can say head. Head, this will be another <coughs> binary predicate. So this is true if and only if m when started in the empty st state is at the mth position of the tape in step, in step n, in mth cell of tape, in nth step n. And similarly, I can have a predicate, let's call it letter, uh, A, M, uh, N. So this A is from the tape alphabet. So for every letter from the tape alphabet, I'm going to define one such predicate. And this says that uh, this is true if and only if uh, when st M when started on the empty tape has a in the nth cell, in the mth cell of tape in step n. So we are really trying to capture what the state is, what the head is, what the letter it's reading in step n. And then I should say here that uh, initially I start off in state 0. Let's say that's the starting state. Okay, yeah. Uh, and initially the tape is empty, so here I have the tape alphabet, and I guess I should also introduce another symbol over here, call it blank. So I should say uh, initially the tape is blank, which means for all x, uh, letter A. X letter blank x zero. So in the zeroth step, 
every position of the tape is blank because I'm starting from the empty, empty tape. And initially, I'm in the first cell of the tape, so head 0, 0. So this is saying that where, where I'm starting. Uh, and then I need to say that in every step, I'm going to proceed exactly as the deterministic Turing machine wants me to proceed. So let me just give an example. Suppose I'm in state 0, and I'm reading A1, and suppose the, tra the deterministic transition says I should go to state 5, and I should write A2 over there. And uh, let's say I should just keep the head at the same position. So I'll say stay. So neither move left nor move right. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that uh, at any time, if this is, if I if I reach this configuration, if, if I reach a configuration where I'm in state zero and reading a one, then I should do this, right? So it's basically saying that uh, for any position of the tape at any time step. If I have state uh, zero p, so at any time if I'm in state zero and the head is in position x, and if the letter there is a, a one, let's say, uh, at so at, at time t, if the letter at position x is a1, then in the next step, I know this should be the case. So I should say that uh, there exists some t prime such that uh, t prime is a successor of t. So I will just show oh, this, this, let's say successor. So this can be very easily captured in first order logic. I'll just say how it can be done. and. Uh, you know, state, uh, it should be in state 5 at t prime. And since the head is staying wherever it is, so the head should be at the same position, x at t prime. And uh, the letter gets overwritten by 2. So this should be letter a2, x at t prime. And because I'm just staying there, so the rest of the tape should be unchanged. So I should say for all y, y not equal to x implies uh, for all y and for all such letters, for all a's, the tape alphabet is in blank. So letter a x t equals uh, if and only if letter a prime, uh, letter a x t prime. This is saying that the rest of the tape does not change. For any position other than x, for every tape alphabet, if at t I had x, then at t prime also I'll have x. So the only thing I've sort of left out here is what is the successor. But actually, this is not very hard to encode in first order logic. This is the usual way of encoding ordering with a successor relation. So all I need to say is that, OK, in my universe, there's an order. So let's say I'll denote that order by this. So I'll say, OK, no element. Okay, for all x, it's not the case that uh, x is less than x. There's an order, and that's the successor relation on the order. And uh, for all x, uh, either x for all x for all y, either x is less than y, or y is less than x, or y is equal to x. And similarly, for all x for all y for all z, it's transitive. x is less than z. So this defines an order. And then I want to define a successor relation. So I'll say for all x, for all y, successor x, y, if and only if uh, x is less than y. And for all z, uh, if x is less than z, then it either implies y is less than z or y equals to z. Right. So y is a successor of x if y comes after x. And for every z which comes after x, either y comes before that or y is equal to that. So this is really just plain first order logic using the vocabulary of an order relation and a successor predicate. And so I want to add all of this to all of these formulas. And finally, I want to say that the machine halts. 
So let there be a halting state here. So for convenience, let us say the halting state is 1. So I want to add that there is some x such that uh, there is some t such that I am going to reach state 1 t, where this is the halting state. Right. So if I basically conjunct all of these formulas, then you know I think intuitively you can see what I've done is I've basically captured the computations of this Turing machine. So if the machine halts, then certainly I should be able to find a T where the halting state is reached. And uh, if the machine does not halt, then for every finite universe, I will not be able to reach the halting state. For every finite universe means for every finite number of steps. Because here the universe is really these you know, time steps. For every time step, I should not be able to reach uh, the halting state. And so this uh, sort of shows, uh, so, so of course I, I'm, I've, I've not given the proof why a finite model of this implies n halts and vice versa. I've not given a formal proof, but I think what you can see is that this really captures the computation. This is the initial part. This is every step. For every such transition I have in the Turing machine, I'll have to write something. This is specifying order with successor relation. And that's specifying there's a halting state. Okay, so uh, so it shows what we have here. This is also called Trachtenbach's theorem, and uh, I will stop here.